the next panel is also on technology and is been put together by uh, TechSoc. And as I call your name, would be great if you can come up on stage. Uh, the panelists for this, uh, the panelists for this um, uh, panel uh, are uh, Shweta Rajpal Kohli, Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs, Salesforce India and South Asia. Do we have people coming on board? Yeah, okay. Uh, the other panelist that we have with us today is Anu Acharya, Chief Executive Officer, Map My Genome India. We've got Sham Divan, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. And we've got Mr. Sanjeev Bikchandani, Founder and Executive, Vice Chairman, InfoEdge India Limited. And to chair the panel, we will uh, have again with us uh, Anand uh, Padmanabhan, fellow CPI. Hi, everyone. As, as we saw, you know, a lot of interesting themes have come up in the inaugural uh, speeches, uh, particularly issues on the whole conflict between innovation and regulation. And uh, we have a stellar panel here uh, today, and uh, I'll begin uh, with uh, Shweta. Uh, so AI kept coming up a lot, you know, in, in all of this, right? And uh, the interesting thing to see now is how India is going to leverage all this data that resides here and all this activity on the digital economy to build an AI ecosystem. So earlier this year, we uh, saw the uh, Niti Aayog coming out with its AI strategy paper. So I'll begin with the paper because I have heard some of your views on the paper and the overall, you know, lack of coordination or coordination between various ministry. So what, in your view, uh, is, is what we need really to push the AI uh, story ahead? Uh, thanks, Anand. I think uh, it's true. AI has become a buzzword now when we talk artificial intelligence. I think it's, it's now one thing that governments around the globe are trying very hard to regulate or put in place policies that would be meaningful. But whenever we understand the new technology, it's always the case that technology comes before regulation. And that's only fair because it's very hard for governments, for policymakers, for regulators to keep pace with the technological changes that happen. And which is exactly what's happening with AI. But AI seems to be this, this big elephant in the room that nobody really understands. But yet, it's very important that governments are seen to be doing something about AI because uh, there are questions around, will AI displace jobs? What is the ethical use of artificial intelligence? What's going to happen if algorithms are going to decide our lives? Uh, how will the future look like? And if governments are not seen to be regulating this, then they're probably not doing their job. I think uh, what what's important is for us to understand that it's not just something that every government needs to have an AI strategy because uh, what we've seen uh, in most cases is that over-regulation uh, can always change it not necessarily in favor of the consumer, but it can just mess things up too many cooks spoiling the broth. And, and I think that seems to be a bit of a case happening in India because uh, last I heard there were some, some six committees within the government that were looking into AI. Just about every ministry now wants to talk AI because it is a new buzzword. It's something that's fashionable now. It's something that every ministry wants to sort of grab hold of, whether it's science and technology or it's uh, the electronics and IT ministry or it is uh, Niti Aayog or it is, you know, it, it, it's something that everybody wants to have something to do with. But I think if we, if we just step back and look at what's really happening uh, when it comes to the world of big data, technology, AI, and the need for regulation. I think the need for regulation is arising more out of a knee-jerk reaction and almost panic that has set in uh, within regulators and policymakers because of what we now term fashionably as techlash. So the technology backlash that we've seen, whether it's a Cambridge Analytica or it is uh, you know, the kind of data breaches we're seeing around the world, all of those are leading us to ask the question that is the tech industry doing enough to regulate itself? Is there enough within the system to make sure regulations are in place when we talk about big emerging technologies? Or do governments have to step in and almost be excessive in that regulation because we cannot afford to have some of what we have seen? So I think the backdrop is more important because it's in this backdrop that we're seeing privacy regulations come up. It's in this backdrop that we're seeing India's own personal data protection uh, bill that, that, that is come up. 
Uh, and, and it's in this that we're seeing of what you know, we heard in the last panel about uh, the kind of data nationalism, the kind of data sovereignty that we're seeing, which is leading to data localization, where the dangers of regulation will probably far, be far greater than no regulation. So I think we can go deeper into it once, sure. once we move on. Sure. So Sanjeev, turning to you, I think the, the interesting piece about AI, I mean, center of all of this is where is the next entrepreneur coming from and where is the next job going to or where is it coming from? Right, and, uh, and on both, you know, we heard some thoughts in the, you know, with the previous uh, speakers, uh, particularly on the issue of entrepreneurship. Uh, there is a narrative that, you know, India is turning into a digital colony and our entrepreneurs do not have enough data and they are not going to be able to do enough. And you have the Chinese model as the, you know, uh, sort of mirror to this whole uh, story. So what are your thoughts on both these issues and where we are headed? Sure. Uh, is the mic on? Yeah. Uh, See, as far as this uh, digital colony thing is concerned, I think the government of India took a decision long back that look, we will be a relatively open economy uh, as compared to, let's say, a China. Right now, either you reverse that decision uh, or you live with it. Right now, if you live with it, and I think the decision has been, and now that maybe the horse has bolted. Right, if, so if you live with it, uh, then you know there will be international competition. But the truth is. We run Nokri, and Nokri has faced international competition since 2001, right? And we've only become better because of it, right? And it's not as if Indian companies can't beat foreign companies. You put your mind to it, you devote enough resources to it, you work smart, you can do it. So in 2001, Monster came in. Uh, a little bit after that, Dice came in. Uh, you know, LinkedIn has come in. Indeed has come in, and now Google has gotten the job. We are still competing, right? Now I'm not saying we're. We will, all, we will definitely win, but we are competing, and I think we're doing a good job of it. And quite honestly, you know, there are five, six buzzwords which are used in a cluster, right? So it's uh, big data, machine learning, mm -hmm. AI, algorithms, analytics, yeah. and blockchain, six of them, yeah. right? And you ask them, you know, what exactly do you mean? You know, very often they can't explain it, but you know, they can, they're there, you know, you gotta worry about it, right? Now we've been doing stuff in Nokri, uh, which today is called AI. We've been doing this for 10 or 12 years. Right? We didn't know what to call it. We were just doing it. Right? So let me give you an example. So uh, a big problem that we have in, in Nokri is uh, there are now six crore resumes on Nokri, growing at 20,000 resumes a day, with 350,000 updates every day. Right? Uh, and there are a few hundred thousand recruiters searching this database. And there are a, a few hundred thousand job listings on the site. And people come and apply to jobs. So the question really becomes, how do you show the right jobs to the right people? This matching problem, right? Uh, and that is a huge issue here, and has been for the last 15 years. That because it's a jungle, because there's so many jobs and so many resumes, you've got to show the right job to the right person. That A, he'll want to apply for it, and B, the organization will want that thing. There's no point applying for a job where an organization doesn't want you. So it has to be a two-way match. And this two-way match thing is a hard problem to solve. Now, without giving away any trade secrets, we've been working on it for more than a decade now, and we are making progress, and we've made significant progress. And what we have done is now called AI. Now, in this case, we are actually helping people find jobs as opposed to taking away jobs, right? Uh, so where a person would earlier apply for 50 jobs, let's say, over, let's say, a week, on Nokri, you can apply to 20 of the right jobs in one day, right, and have a higher chance of getting a job. And now, will certain roles and jobs and tasks be automated? Answer is probably yes. Uh, does that mean that there will be large-scale sacking in certain industries and certain activities? Maybe, maybe not, right? We have seen, you know, typically what happens when a new technology comes in and certain, you know, tasks get replaced by, by technology. Uh, what happens is the, the companies and organizations uh, that are based on the earlier model don't necessarily decline, they just stop growing, right? And a new activity comes up based on a new model, and that may employ fewer people, no two ways about it. So if you look at the Indian IT industry, IT services industry, for the last four or five or six years, there's been talk of, you know, digitization, platforms, right? The global business model changed. Now, has there been large-scale tracking in large IT companies in India? I have not seen it. There may have been some minor thing, but it's not as if a organization has downsized from 300,000 people to 50,000 people. It has not happened. 
what has happened is growth in headcount has tapered off, and organizations have adapted. Right? So very many IT services companies are now acquiring platform companies. They're building their own platforms, building their own products, uh, and they are getting business on a new model. Now, if the old model had continued, would they have moved from 300,000 to 600,000? Maybe. So those new jobs are not being created to the extent that they might have otherwise been. Right? But the truth is you don't have a choice because today you are facing competition from Brazil, from Chile, from Argentina, from Portugal, from Spain, from East Europe. Basically, you had an advantage that uh, you had a very large number of engineers who could do these things. And so the model was, hey, you have a problem? We'll throw 4,000 bodies for three years and then solve the problem. Now, when platforms are coming, you don't need 4,000 bodies. You need 60 people, 100 people. And 60 or 100 people, you can find in Romania, you can find in Bulgaria, you can find in Portugal, you can find in Spain, you can find in, 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 in Brazil. So suddenly new competition has emerged. And if you don't adapt to the new model, you are going to go out of business. And so there's no choice but to adapt. Second is, look, in the internet world, with communication being what it is, uh, in the telecom world, with data flows being across borders, uh, competition is global. There is no question about it. And you have to be globally competitive. To be globally competitive, right, you have to then be at the cutting edge. And you cannot be at the cutting edge if you're not facing global competition. You simply won't stretch. Right? We would not have improved the way we have improved if there was no competition. You would have still been where we were 20 years ago. Right? So there is no choice, you have to embrace it. Uh, now, let's say a chatbot replaces a customer support person. Right? Uh, so a chatbot comes in, will that actually replace a customer support person or will the customer support person then migrate to a different kind of job description? So I will look at what the chatbot is saying, I will audit and if I find something wrong, I will intervene. Or the chatbot doesn't satisfy a customer, it, the call will be routed to me. Right? Or maybe the, the availability of a chatbot will massively increase the number of customer queries. We don't know yet. Right? Uh, if, you, if you look at the mid-80s, when uh, the Rajiv Gandhi government was in power and you know it was first talked about we will get computers into banks and government offices. <coughs> there was a lot of apprehension that it will take away jobs. The truth is it didn't take away jobs. Right? You were able to do, achieve much more with the same number of people, hopefully over time. New jobs were created, a whole new industry was born. 4,000 engineering colleges came up to, to cater to Van needs. So, so you know, the truth is it's, it's a changing world, it's an evolving world. What will happen, we don't really know. But there are many possibilities, right? What has happened in the past is that while technology may have changed the nature of certain jobs, right, it has not taken away so many jobs as stopped the growth in certain kind of jobs, but other jobs have increased. Right. right? Now, if that, if precedence is, uh, you know, if, the, if that is taken as a precedence and you would say history might repeat itself, maybe that's what will happen. But we don't know for sure. But we've got to keep you know, keep eyes on the ball. That's why I say. Keep right. your eyes on the ball. So I'll come back to you with some of these ideas around <coughs> skilling, for instance, which is the central part of the piece then, right? I mean, because that's a place where policy could make valuable interventions. Uh, but Anil, coming to you, uh, the Chinese story has, you know, been a, a kind of a dominant, you know, presence all through these conversations today. And uh, interestingly, you work on a sector where, you know, it's really sunrise tech, uh, which is at the intersection of biology, digital and you know that whole convergence which uh, in fact the secretary was also speaking about right and there uh, a few weeks ago the world uh, woke up to the news that a chinese uh, a researcher has basically uh, done gene editing on a human you know, embryo right uh, and then the part of the reason could be that there are no clear ethical parameters or barriers or boundaries but you know where we are that may not be you know how how we are addressing this whole issue so in your view uh, how is India poised to take on this next wave of uh, innovation and, and growth? And then uh, what do you think we need to do from a policy standpoint particularly? Um, one so I think you know, when you look at what happened with the Chinese, um, the CRISPR baby, I think they started work on this many years ago. But I think no one really thought that they would actually come up with a live, you know, actually they said there was a live birth that happened with uh, gene-edited embryos. Now the motivation of, an, of a person who's actually doing that is to actually eliminate disease, right? So he started saying, I'm going to edit this gene, which will say, I'm going to eliminate cholera, various other things. 
Now that's a very noble cause from an individual's perspective, a scientist's perspective, and I think those kind of things will continue to happen. Uh, now, while the rest of the world was saying that we will make these global, like we we'll make these standards, ethical standards, the problem is, and I think also Sanjeev touched upon it, there's a global missing reason, right? If one uh, person in the world does it, I think people want to access that technology will ultimately go there unless there is a global standard for regulation across the world. So, especially when it comes to everything, gene embryos or otherwise, if it is not allowed in any part of the world, it's fine. If it's allowed in any part of the world, I think someone or other is going to go there. <coughs> I think that was true even of uh, there was a scientist who did something that uh, controlled your, uh, through your brain, you want to control your, through, through your thoughts. And he went to that country and started doing experiments. So, I think you know, from a scientist's perspective, you can't stop a scientist from going to any part of the world and being able to do that. So one, that part will always remain. So regulations have not only to be um, global, I mean national, but have to, they have to be more global in nature, especially when it comes to that. Now the second thing is, uh, one of the challenges is if India has to actually bear upon some of these uh, regulations that are there today, especially in life sciences, I think two, three things need to be done. We need to see where regulations started from. And about a century ago, I think most of the regulation came from some mishaps that happened. So the first regulation in life sciences started when there was, they found there was a serum from a horse that was collected. It killed 10 or 15 babies, and that's when we started doing it. Now, when that happened, I think there was a very extensive set of things on how deep or, you know, why, what would something be considered as being regulation, regulated, right? So whether it was harmful, whether there was malintent or things like that. The challenge today is that while we already know that, we are not doing a very deep dive into all those factors. So if you want to do anything in life sciences, there are ethical implications for sure. There are also implications that might be of uh, how you misinterpret certain things. There might be people who might be able to use data in the wrong way. And then there are things that, are, that might potentially have implications in other parts of uh, activities that you do. So I think whenever any regulation has to happen, it has to be done with a very, very thorough analysis of not just saying this problem happened and therefore we take a knee-jerk reaction, but you have to really deep dive because there are so many interconnected elements. Because anything that you do in genetics is likely to also have an implication in agriculture, in nutrition, in fitness, in various other fields. So it's not today about saying that, you know, you can have five different departments and I can isolate this department and say, if this is the case, we can be able to do that. So for instance, I think whether it is regulation of who signs the report, whether it is regulation of, um, um, you know, how do you actually regulate something like a BP copy? Uh, if it is regular, all of these are not just impacting one specific part, it's impacting multiple industries. It's also impacting not just India, it impacts the rest of the world. So I think regulation today has to be done in many ways. I think India has done both good and bad in terms of uh, the regulatory aspects. I think in, in some cases, whether it was cotton, BT cotton or otherwise, I think uh, that was a good way. There was a second part where uh, a lot of industry um, bodies got together, created some uh, guidelines for biosimilars. I think that was a good uh, aspect of where regulation happened. But we've also seen a lot of cases where regulation has been usually as a reaction to something rather than a, as a proactive case. And I think in men, most cases, I think, uh, especially so in life sciences, I think it has to be much more dived into deeper, whether it is uh, looking at data ethics, whether it is looking into um, how it impacts human life and, and other things. Right. So, Sham, we have heard uh, now chatbots, CRISPR babies, we've heard a lot of stuff about innovation. And interestingly, you have been instrumental in, in some important ways in, in giving us this very important and valuable right to, to stop uh, data from turning into a weapon, particularly in the hands of the state and even more broadly with the tech companies in the form of the right to privacy. Uh, as we know, I mean, we have a nine judge bench verdict now which says it's part of our fundamental rights and subsequently it has been applied in the Aadhaar verdict. Uh, one could agree or disagree over the final set of outcomes. Uh, but uh, where we are coming from is to really probe your thoughts on in a democratic setting, uh, how does the constitutional framework and the legal framework adapt to many of these disruptive changes, you know, happening all around us? Thanks very much. Is, is that a yeah, board of sorry, Okay. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll use the sort of uh, the peg which you suggested in terms of the constitutional framework and try and frame this issue in that 
uh, context. I think the way I look at uh, the Constitution and constitutionalism, it's probably the religion of the time, at least in this part of the world. It's a mandate, it's universal, it keeps us together as a nation, it protects our diversity, and it's founded on a huge number of abiding values which we tend to forget in our press for adopting new technologies. So the way I see it, and the manner in which constitutionalism comes in, probably comes in at three levels. First, a new technology perhaps ought to pass through the hoop of certain, what we describe as fundamental rights or core values in the Constitution. I think the second feature is with regard to national interest or public interest. I think it may be constitutional, but it could still actually pass through as not being necessarily in the national or the public interest. And the third major factor, as I see it, in terms of technology and what was discussed, is in terms of the environmental impact. And perhaps I'll just give you a couple of illustrations on this. I think BT Cotton was mentioned just a short while ago. So I'll give you some live examples of what's happening in the Supreme Court just now. There's a real contest on Monsanto seeking to assert that it has a patent right in so far as BT Cotton is concerned. And if the court accepts Monsanto's it will essentially mean that, in so, that Monsanto will, be, will have a power to not only get an injunction or a restraining order, but also potentially earn royalty with regard to every cotton seed which has BT in it. And Monsanto also claims that BT can be embedded or introduced in rice and a large brinjal and a whole bunch of other food items. So this is really now a food security, national security question. And the choice before the court is, do we give it a patent or do we give it benefit sharing under the Plant Varieties Act? So that's the, that's the real tough choice in terms of 3J of the Patent Act, which says that we do not in India allow patents in so far as uh, plants and uh, animals are concerned. We permit them and recognize them only as far as microorganisms are concerned. So it's not really constitutional, but it's public interest and it's public policy. Let me give you another example in the context of environment. So you've got this new directive which the Ministry of Environment has introduced, where to control SO2 emissions and NOx emissions, you have to introduce uh, flue gas desulfurization plants in all our thermal power stations across the country. The deadline was, I think, November or December 2019. The court is probably going to extend it by a couple of years. Now, the impact of that, which is probably that we're going to have a reduced uh, what, uh, SO2 and NOx emissions, is that you've got two technologies. There's ammonia, which hasn't been scaled up to the levels at which we uh, operate our thermal power stations. And you have a limestone-based technology. And nobody has thought of the amount of limestone India is going to have to move around all over the country just to get this uh, flue gas desulfurization plants up and running across the thing. So it's going to be, so, so you have a solution but which is technological, but I think the environmental cost is going to be just enormous. And I think we are not able to see through this, uh, which is unfortunate, and which is, I think, where we've got to weigh in terms of regulators, policymakers, as to whether we're going to just introduce a new technology or study its environmental impact. And the third issue in terms of something which, which, since you mentioned it, in terms of privacy, I think that I would put broadly in the constitutional framework. And there I would say that our constitution, by and large, in terms of its, in terms of its direction, its philosophy, was, and with, uh, with contemporaneous constitutions at the time when it was drafted and keeping up with the times, was to contain the state. It was to limit government. It was to keep a huge area available to individuals to flourish, to explore their lives, and to sort of generally lead lives without getting into other people's way. I think now the new constitutional challenge in the context of technology 
is do these constitutional principles, can they be realigned against the corporate world? Can they be realigned against enterprise? Because now with big data, as you mentioned, the amount of power which certain corporations uh, are going to wield is going to be immense. And so we're going to really need new tools, new principles, and new designs if, if we are to preserve those abiding constitutional values, which are so, so important, and which I think as the earlier speakers mentioned, we tend to discount. But it's 69 years for working a constitution is a very short period of time. And believe me, it, I mean, we're still very low down in the learning curve. I mean, it's just we, we, we had a near miss in the emergency, for example, and we got lucky as a nation. But I think there's a huge more effort which is required. And then when you have these disruptive technologies, you're going to really have to preserve your diversity which the Constitution protects while ensuring that technologies can evolve and develop in at least as reasonable an environment as possible. So, Shweta, uh, with that, you know, let me come back to you. Uh, you mentioned the whole tech clash and what's really happening is in some ways a sort of response to perceived ill effects of social media and so on. But one of the genuine concerns, and going back to the Monsanto example that uh, Sham had mentioned, is simply the fact that tomorrow it's not patent as much as data, right, which, yeah. which holds the key to innovation. And, and already people are talking about it. There are articles, you know, which have gained a lot of you know, attention over the past year on Amazon's antitrust paradox. Uh, and it will be interesting to hear your thoughts on, in a big data ecosystem, how do you balance these two things, right? One of two big, you know, players holding all this data and the keys to innovation versus, you know, many startups which would like to do that stuff and have access to data. So I think very important point because what you mentioned, balance, I think that's the key. Because very often when we talk technology, the debate gets extremely polarized. You're either talking that, okay, are you on the side of, of big data, Silicon Valley, the companies who are all out to get you, or are you on the side of regulators who are like, oh, rain it all in, otherwise, you know, it's like doomsday ahead of you. So when we talk about data being the, the next oil or data being the lifeline of, of the digital economy, I think what is really important is understanding that the two most important stakeholders now, which is corporates, as well as uh, when you talk about the rest of the ecosystem, which is your regulators, policy makers, the judiciary, the understanding of what's going on in the world is extremely important and both stakeholders taking ownership of what's going on. So can you say that it's all okay for tech companies to just say, you have a hands-up approach and say that we're not responsible for this? A big no, because ultimately if tech companies do not take the responsibility of ensuring ethical use of technology, of ensuring that technology is not being misused. I mean, we cannot say for sure that technology is good or bad. I mean, it isn't as black and white as that. But at the same time, how we use technology is what will determine some of those questions that, for instance, Sham has raised here. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we looking at constitutional validity? Are we looking at technology advancing human rights? Or are we looking at technology taking away some of those basic human rights? So I think uh, if we do not see corporates going ahead and offering this kind of regulation, being part of the entire ecosystem and debate, saying that we are the ones who want regulation, then we're going to see a lot of um, a regressive regulation, and that's something that tech companies will have to accept then, because they have not been part of that debate. They have not offered themselves as the solution providers to what is going on right now. So for instance, to quote what's happening, we're, we're, uh, we're in some ways a, a large tech company based out of Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco headquarters, where we look at one billion AI-empowered predictions that happen every single day. Now that's huge for a company like Salesforce to do, like, and this is all just recent stuff. But we have just, for instance, appointed uh, a chief of ethical and human use of technology officer. Now that's a very lofty title. It may almost sound like, okay, it's fashionable to do. But at the end of the day, when you have employee activism, when you have just about every second person being an activist today on how technology is being used, what are you doing with that big data? If you yourself do not question what, who your customers are, who is your customer? Is, it, is, is a technology that you're be providing being used for warfare? Are you using AI for uh, bad immigration policy? What is going on in the world if you're not questioning that and you're not bringing in the ethics debate, you're not bringing trust as a, as a differentiator, then somewhere you're going to lose out. And, and I think that's the critical bit that corporates need to step up the game. At the same time, we also need 
regulators, policy makers to be better informed and to be willing to, uh, to say yes, we want to be better informed on technology. We cannot have the kind of congressional debates that we hear right now where we say, oh, we don't understand tech. We belong to another old school where we say, you know, it's another world. Can you help explain how Google search works? Because the world has moved on. And if, if, we, if we still say we live in that cocoon, then somewhere this part of the stakeholder ecosystem is not doing its job properly. So I would say balance is the answer when we move forward. Right. Sanjeev, you wear many hats, right? And one part of it is investor in many of these startups and uh, some of them, you know, really working in the frontier of emerging tech. Uh, so what are your thoughts, A, on the whole regulation bit, right? And how, how have we fared in the last few years on, on regulating emerging tech? And the second bit is simply the whole issue of data sharing and, and new entrepreneurs emerging. How, how are we going to make that happen? Look, uh this regulation thing is a bit of a minefield and, uh, you know, sensible regulation is great. Bad regulation can be a disaster. Now, what is sensible, what is bad, you know, quite honestly, that's a much, much deeper discussion. And I'm not sure we even begun, right? Uh, so, when I put my profile on LinkedIn or on Nokri, does my data belong to me? If I have signed up an agreement that, look, I want you to show it to recruiters, obviously I surrendered that right. And I've given Nokri a right to. That's, that's why you're registering. Because Nokri gives that data to the to recruiters. But can somebody use it to call me up and start selling insurance? So technically we are covered. We call a clause there. Yes. So the truth is so the truth is we discourage that because we know people don't like it. So so you know, uh, this is a slightly tricky field. Uh, what you want to do is to allow legitimate business to flourish, to allow innovation to happen. At the same time, not allow stuff to be received. And that's a bit of a balancing act. And I don't know what the, what really the answer is. I, you know, I think it will have to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. So you will have very general clauses like uh, organizations must take ad adequate due diligence to ensure that data is not misused by their clients to ensure there's adequate data security. The truth is guys who have to hack will always be one step ahead of security. Right? A hack, and hackings do take place and they will continue to take place because they're very smart people trying to hack. question is, did you take action soon enough after you discovered it? Did you announce it? Did you disclose? Are you taking continuous measures to ensure it doesn't happen again? Right? Uh, if you take data for a certain protect, uh, are you using it for something else without consent? I think that's, you know, stuff like that. So it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis. But you talked about startups. So I'll just give you two examples of uh, very young startups you invested in the last three months. I think Venk, you'll be interested in this. So, uh, you know, there's a startup, now three guys, uh, they are agri-engineers from IIT Kharagpur. They both, all three went to Ireland, got the same class, and they did the, the special program in agriculture, the MBA in agriculture. And they've come out of Ireland and they decided to work out of Indore, the tier two town, and they said, we'll work in four districts around Indore, rural areas. And they launched a service. It says, farmers can dial up this number and get expert advice, free, right? And they got thousands of calls, right? And then they said, okay, now you can even WhatsApp us your stuff, take a photo of your plant, and if there's a problem, we look at the photo and give you advice that this is the disease. And then they began to sell uh, stuff to these farmers, right? Now what's happened? This company is doing agri-input e-commerce, right? Now you may say they are just replacing the offline retail with online, but that's not the case, right? The problem is that the farmers in that district, they go to a regular shop, they are very often missold stuff. They need two things, they are sold six things. And it is estimated that 25% of the stuff they are sold is counterfeit. So it's not as effective. Right? Farmers have begun to trust them. They are getting genuine stuff, they are getting the right stuff, the right advice. And here are experts who are giving it. Now, hopefully, now, now this, this company is now also getting data. Which farmer, how much land, geographically located where, what kind of soil, what kind of crop, what are you planting now, okay? And what are you going to plant next? And what did you plant last year, right? Now, as they spread to more districts, it's going to be more and more. Now, they have a legitimate right to use this data to further their business and to give better advice to the clients and, you know, and, and so on, right? To plan the inventory of products, to, you know, to, to, to source better and cheaper, right? And the truth is, if somebody else comes in, and tries to compete with them, they won't have that data. Now, if you're telling me that this company should surrender its rights to its data and 
throat everybody. So I don't think it's fair, right? The whole logic of a patent is that, look, I invested in R&D. I created an invention. Therefore, I have exclusive right to use that or license it for the next 17 years or however many years. I, mean, I don't know what the law says now, right? And that is a legitimate right which is given to, in India also, to very, very companies. So I should have legitimate right to my data. The data I, uh, now, each individual person's data is also his. So there would probably be dual ownership of data, the individual and also the company you gave it to. And then on an aggregate level, it's the company. I think that is a legitimate source of competitive advantage. Now, if this company had not been an Indian startup, if it had been a multinational or an American company, should the rules have been different? My answer is no. We are an open economy, rules are the same. So, I mean, I guess... Uh, and this is an instance, this is an instance where farmers are being helped, hopefully productivity is going up, hopefully stuff is not being missold, right, and so on. Now, another example I'll give you. Uh, about three months ago, we invested in a small startup uh, in Kota. Now, no VC will ever invest in Kota or Indoor, right? Okay. So now this startup, what does it do? It is in rural healthcare. So what they've done is, there aren't enough doctors in villages. So if you're unwell, you come to a city, see a doctor, you take a day off, a day or two off work, you lose income, right? And then you go back to the village. It costs money and you lose income. So what they're saying is, okay, fine, for repeat visits, you know, go to your nearest pharmacy. And there are pharmacies in villages. And they've connected pharmacies. And over the internet, uh, through their app, you know, you can extend information. The doctor will advise you on, the, on that. And you pay a certain consultation fee, and the pharmacy sells you the medicine. So the person benefits. He's getting, him, uh, he's getting uh, uh, you know, medical assistance cheaper, closer to his house. The pharmacy benefits. It's selling more medicines. These people are not making money yet, because they're not charging for this. Okay? Uh, but over time, as they gather data, this data will be valuable. That, you know, okay, which patient, what medicine, which doctor prescribing what, you know, and somewhere pharma companies can use it. And that's how they hope to make money. Somewhere, somewhere medical insurance companies can use it. And that's how they hope to make money eventually. Now, their business is based on data. Okay? Or let me give you another example. We invested in a second company in Indore, right? And this company is in the business of helping the small retailer compete better with online as well as organized retail. Right? And in the process, we are gathering data. Now, how do they do it? They simply service them better. That we will give you in six hours anything that's stocked out. A big company typically has a journey cycle of two weeks. Right? So I don't have to invest so much money in you know, 20 bars of soap. I can buy three and get it replaced faster as I'm, stocked, as I'm running out. Now, the small retail loves it. Uh, the big companies don't mind because, you know, their stuff is, there are no stock out, so they're selling more of their stuff. The small companies, which don't have access to the, you know, the kind of distribution network that, that will be small retail, they're also very happy. Now, when they gather data, they're going to arrange for small business loans, right, to these small shopkeepers that's using data. Now, will they have a competitive advantage? Will they have, if they have good data and they use it for themselves? And should they be bound to share it with competition? Answer is no. It's a legitimate asset they create. So Anu, I think uh, what uh, Sanjeev points out interestingly is the whole data ecosystem and the various benefits there. But with health data particularly, there is a whole understanding that under law or the proposed bill and even internationally, there's a sensitive personal data. And uh, in your... It is sensitive course, at an individual level. It is not sensitive at aggregate level. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, the, the one of the exceptions is you anonymize the data. Right, but uh, I mean, I, I, I have heard mixed views about what you can really get out of the data if you anonymize it vis a vis you know, having some degree of personal identifier there. Uh, but the larger question is, you know, in the healthcare context, how do you build a, an ecosystem of data exchange markets and so on where, you know, you could do this in a more responsible manner? That's the first uh, point. And the second is going back to what uh, Sham had mentioned about the environment and, right, the whole biotech space with BT cotton and all these. Uh, you know, uh, technological innovations. Uh, the issue really has been, as you mentioned early on, to look beyond the product to look at the overall ecosystem. And how do you think India fares in that regard when it comes to science-driven uh, regulation as opposed to paranoia? Well, I think the first question you asked was how do people <coughs> how do people how do uh, companies how they in the healthcare space how they can do this responsibly? And I think especially when it comes to genomics. 
I think most companies do that because uh, I think there's a lot of um, concerns about genetic data because it's permanent. It's, you know, it's also an identifier in some sort because if you have your entire genetic code, you know, that could serve as a potential identifier. Now, so as a result, I think for most companies, and including Map My Genome, we would take that, you know, whenever we take uh, anybody's consent, it is to make sure that the anonymized data can be used on an aggregate basis. The, the way you do it responsibly is you make sure that, you know, ethically you explain to everyone what each of this, uh, what does uh, genetic testing mean, what does what is DNA, and ultimately, I think, what does this anonymized data give you? Now, there are two things. One is for a consumer, if there is, that data that is stored with us, for instance, you can get constant updates in terms of if there is new discoveries, if there's a new uh, understanding of what um, what potentially can be a disease risk that can be, you know, that you know later on, I think all those can be done. So on a personal basis, I think an individual benefits by having that information being constantly updated. But I think the bigger value that any um, scientific uh, driven innovation is driven on is on whatever has been done over the many over many years, right? So we all stand on the shoulders of giants. So if we didn't have data of many thousands of years of research going on, today we wouldn't be at where we are today in medical uh, science. So similarly, I think today all the people who actually uh, consent to giving their anonymized data are actually building on that science. So one is that. But I think the bigger question today is saying that can we define what is ethical? Can we define what is right? Can we define what is this thing on an overall global basis? Because I think, you know, for different times, different things might mean different things to different people, right? So I think the bigger question is saying, when I talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, regulation in the uh, life sciences space, I think the most important when we started off with was saying we value human life, uh, that if you do something that kills somebody, I think that was the first part, right? The second thing was to say, was there mis, uh, mal intent from the part of the company or an innovator to make sure that that is uh, that was a problem? But eventually, I think today, for instance, I think after many years of um, uh, innovation and doing trials on on animals, I think there is also the whole point of animal welfare, right? So you want to make sure that animals are also protected under that. But I think you couldn't do that unless you came through a certain set of you know steps that led us to where we are today. So. Importantly, I think today we need to relook at everything that we are doing and say, if we look at it from a global perspective, are we looking at it from a human race? Are we looking at it from a, you know, all living things perspective? Are we looking at it from, you know, what is it that you're looking at? Are you looking at beyond Earth, beyond Mars, right? Ultimately, I think define a set of principles that all of us believe in. And I think that's the hard part because what might be right for one country today might not be right for the other country also. But the truth is we are also global. We all move so so quickly around that that is the hard part. But I would say that in spite of all of that, I think there are ways to make sure that the regulations are much more balanced uh, with the knowledge we have today. Right? So we want to make sure, for instance, that you don't kill anybody with whatever invention that you or innovation that you have. You want to make sure that at least the basic things are done. But the bigger thing is saying, you know, when it comes to data, is mostly about malintent. Right? Our, our company is going to misuse for something. I was so hoping that we could use uh, all the Nokri people to sell genome patris, but I guess we can't. <laughs> uh, but uh, it would be similarly, I think, you know, questions of, you know, what is ethics? It, it, it ultimately, I think when it comes to medical or healthcare data, it's your own data. And I think a consumer should be able to allow what, what they are willing to share, what they're willing to use, what they're willing to donate back to the community. So I think that is where it is. Today, I think India, there are, we, we need to do a lot more detail in terms of understanding of how scientific um, uh, innovation can be regulated. I think we, we have to do a lot more detailed study on the multiple things that are impacting that innovation because everything is so connected. And I think that's where we haven't done as well as we could have done. And I think uh, here is where we, we have a lot of innovators in the country. And I think a lot of innovators who potentially can actually license this out, outside of India as well. They can license it within India, but I think our understanding of uh, how we regulate needs to be a lot more tighter. It needs to be a lot more understanding, proactive in terms of how we look at all of, uh, all of regulation. And the third is to make sure that we can get a lot more input from people who are actually doing this, whether it's in, within India or, or from outside or, or, or otherwise. So I think getting regulators in, you know, advice uh, maybe getting different ways of being able to get that input, I think, would be very helpful. But I think 
we've gone, you know, we are doing some things right, but there are many more things that we can, I think. Sham, before we head to Q&A, a final set of questions to you uh, on Aadhaar. Let's just bring the elephant in the room, show it out. Uh, India's national big data for it. Now, the interesting thing about the Aadhaar verdict is that the technologists on the petitioners, interestingly, say the court doesn't get technology. They just didn't get what it meant to be in a digital surveillance uh, system. And uh, the respondents, or the ones especially from the private industry, say the court doesn't get startups. We shut down private authentication. What should we have built a whole you know, business around DKYP? So to both sides, the court doesn't get something, and that something is not the law. That's the interesting part here. It's things which are outside the traditional domain of courts, but increasingly we see a world where courts are uh, forced to have to look into these things. I mean, how does a state resident data hub work is a technological question in many ways much more than a legal question. Similarly, how does EKYC work is much more of a business question than a legal question in many, many ways. And courts have done this in the past. It's not that it's a completely new phenomenon, but I think technology amplifies the range of complexity in the adjudicatory uh, process. So to you, how do you perceive the way courts now can evolve to address this job better? I'll just tell you, um, something, uh, well, let me tell you the interesting journey, at least from a lawyer's perspective. Uh, I think what's happened is that until I would reckon the turn of this century, uh, we were following global precedents just about everywhere. That's the manner in which it was. It was relatively a new constitution. We were behind technologies which were introduced in the West, would be introduced in India several years or decades later, if at all. And so we always had someone to copy or someone to lead us. What's, ha what's different now is apart from the world being flat and technologies coming up, uh, you know, simultaneously being introduced across the world, and in some cases like Aadhaar, a new experiment uh, on the Indian subcontinent, we have a re relatively fast track system by which the Supreme Court of India very quickly. You can directly petition the Supreme Court of India, which doesn't happen in any jurisdiction uh, that I know of elsewhere. So you're suddenly going to have a challenge from the standpoint of our top judges having to understand technology. For that, you've got to be able to first explain it to lawyers who can, you know, make a mess of it. But then you've got to sort of try and endeavor to explain to the judges, and then the judges have to make a final call. So I think you're going to see quite a bit of this with no hand-holding, with very little guidance from international precedents. And so India is going to be right out there uh, on the front line, the vanguard of laying down principles in new technology. So that's a, that's a challenge, and we'll muddle through uh, uh, fairly, I mean, certainly. Uh, as far as, since you mentioned Aadhaar, I, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about the judgment, but I'll tell you something of what happened before the judgment, or at least that's my understanding of it. The, the, if, if you would ask lawyers who were advising government, they would more or less unanimously have told you that if you want a project such as this, you need a law in India. I, I think, you know, it, it's a, probably a no-brainer. But I think the people who are in technology, the people who wanted to push the project, the entrepreneurial energy, was all, let's expand it and we'll see how it works down the line. And so long as it's voluntary, it's all fine in India. I think people didn't understand that we still have a certain resilience in terms of our constitutional values, which can, from time to time, manifest themselves as it did in this case in the form of a privacy judgment. Uh, so what you had is this huge program, which wasn't, in my view, sufficiently vetted at a lawyer's level before it was put out there. And then I think you also have, uh, I mean, this is, this is not really law. This is just common sense that in uh, the context of private uh, enterprise and, you know, banking, it, you had until now at least some integrity to your KYC system where you had either a bank officer or someone verifying, looking at you once uh, before opening a bank account and checking the facts. 
you have dumbed down the system with Aadhaar to such an extraordinary extent where it's only your self-certification which matters. And if you're going to, if you're going to leverage your entire financial economy, so many other elements where KYC is required on a self-certification system, I mean, I think that's an extraordinary degree of trust uh, for any state to have. And then to substitute it. So I think, I mean, my, my answer is that perhaps the real, um, the, the legal story in terms of some of the concerns which are expressed by uh, entrepreneurs, etc., could have been pretty easily addressed if people had looked carefully at the law before this huge project was, uh, was whatever, rolled out across the country. I think that is where the slip-up took place more than, and then, you know, in terms of design, etc., but we can sort of uh, debate that uh, quite endlessly. If I could just add a little bit to what, yeah, uh, what Sam was saying. I think uh, a very, very, very um, important point here about why we're seeing some kind of um, issues with regard to regulations in terms of, you know, first explaining to the lawyers, then explaining to the judiciary, explaining to the judges. I think this is a very, very critical point because what we're seeing happen now is that under the garb of, in fact, you had mentioned national security in, in, in your last uh, intervention. You know, it's all very well to say, A, we don't understand it. It's inconvenient to go through the hassle of understanding it and diving deep into it. B, it sounds like it's not a national security interest. So you know what? Let's just go ahead and localize all data because it's convenient to do that. It sounds good. You know, we don't understand law enforcement access. We don't understand how technology can help us arrive at a solution which may be technically complicated, but let's dive deeper into it. But you know what? That doesn't make sense because it's more difficult. It's a harder choice to make. So let's go with the easier choices. Now, that's the big danger because that's where lies the danger of, of what I think uh, uh, Venkatesh Shukla was saying earlier. You know, Are we going to come in the way of innovation? Are we going to come in the way of just basic technology? Or are we, as, as Sanjeev was saying, are we going to turn the clock back? Because you know earlier we didn't like the China model, and now we just think China is great, and they've, they've, just, they've just done it right. So we should just go ahead and ape China, never mind what we've done with our economy all these years. Or, or to the point that Anu made, you know, how will you go ahead and innovate and even do on any of those genome studies? You talk about data. You require data for good purposes as much as there are dangers of misuse of data. So I think uh, we're just following a very convenient path because it's convenient for us to put in place regulations that are simple.